If you were to come with me to Marion, Ohio, you would find there a huge state penitentiary, over 5,000 inmates. I did a lot of prison visitation, and one day was there with a group of visitors, and a Latino man stood up, and this is the story he told us. When I came here into prison, I was a very bitter person because I'm here because somebody squealed on me. Somebody told the story. And so when I came in, I knew that I had one purpose in life, and that was to get even. And so I would spend all of my free time here plotting how I was going to get that guy when I got out. But then I found Jesus Christ as my savior and realized that for what I had done, I was forgiven, and so I could forgive him. And so since then, I've been a different person. I've been happier. I haven't been dwelling on that at all. In fact, having forgiven that person, that was no longer part of my current life. I just try to get along here and think of good things that I will do when I get out. We also visited another prison, which is just a couple of miles south of here. It's called Franklin Medical Center, because there is the hospital for all the prisons in the state of Ohio. And one day, there was a very scruffy looking white man. He looked hungry, but he stood up and this is what he said. People see me as an inmate. People see me as a thief. They think I am locked up here behind bars, but let me tell you, since I found Jesus Christ as my savior, I'm free. Now, is there anything behind what these men are saying? Is there any substance to it, or is it just a projection of their wish fulfillment? Is it just looking up into the heavens with all of their desires and their wishes is it just a hallucination of a spirit longing for a better life? I don't think so. Because when we remember what Jesus said from the cross, didn't Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a very, very important thing for those who are sentenced and whose sin is obvious. They have been convicted for breaking the law. But Jesus not only pronounced forgiveness, he also pronounced new and restored life for those who have been forgiven. Think of this wonderful story of the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus was was of a family who lived in Olivet, on Mount Olivet, the, the, the town of Bethany, which overlooks Jerusalem. The family was very precious to Jesus. He had visited there, and he knew Mary and Martha, who were Lazarus's two sisters. Lazarus had evidently died of some kind of a sickness. Jesus stood by the tomb of Lazarus, where he had been, bur had been buried, and Jesus wept. That tells you something about our Lord. Because Jesus said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. And Jesus there was just weeping, weeping over the human condition, weeping over that we just are born in this world, not knowing what's going to happen to us. And we get sick, and we die, and Jesus weeps because we don't always ask the Lord for the helps that he's only there waiting to give us. We read how Paul supported the same teaching when, when he said it's the Spirit of God which filling us brings us new life. Paul wrote, if the Spirit of God which raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, God will give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit that dwells in you. Well, isn't it great that inmates can be forgiven by the, these miraculous acts of God 
that he does in bestowing his forgiveness to them. Well, what about us who do our best to try to keep from breaking the law? What about us? But don't we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors? But how serious are we? What does that mean? Does it refer only to financial debts? Does it refer only to trespassing? Or does it also mean like meanness and selfishness? What does it mean? The great German theologian Ernst Lohmeyer, who was executed by, by the communists in East Germany, in setting the ancient Hebrew and the Aramaic and the Greek languages to really get at the meaning of what Jesus is saying in that prayer, the conclusion that Ernst Lohmeyer reached is that when we say forgive us our debts, we're referring to everything, absolutely everything, because everything we have we've received from God. I mean, just think about it. The air that we breathe, the materials of the piano which Josh has been playing, the light that surrounds us in this lovely room, everything we have received from God. So when we say, forgive us our debts, we're saying, I know I'm indebted for everything. Please forgive me for all of it, dear Lord, because I know only too well that I'm not sufficiently grateful and realizing that all of that is from God. God gives new life. Just think of that wonderful story of the dry bones. Well, now, what's the background of that? Israel had been conquered by the Babylonians. And in that conquering, it was called the 70 years, the 70 year exile. And because of that conquering, they'd lost the temple, which was the center of their civilization in Jerusalem. It was destroyed. Their precious law, the Torah, which enabled them to live a life of law and order, could not be followed in Babylonia. The centuries-old dynasty of King David, gone. Their precious promised land, Israel, now occupied by a foreign power. So Israel had actually become like a valley of dry bones. And even worse, their prophets, like Jeremiah, said, it's your own fault. Because look, God gave you everything, and what did you make of it? Weren't you selfish and weren't you greedy? Didn't you oppress your poor? Didn't you forget to pay their wages? And generally, didn't you behave like a bad neighbor? But Ezekiel the prophet, who was living there with the ancient Israelites in Babylonia, he said that he had had this vision from God about this valley of dry bones. And in the vision, the dry bones would what? They would come back to life. They would be put back together and become living bodies. And the Lord God would breathe, breathe life into them once again, just as the Lord had initially breathed life into Adam and Eve. Well, then think also of American slaves. American slaves. Slavery was like being dead, dry bones. But didn't the slaves write a song about it? Them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Now hear the word of the Lord. The head gun connected to the neck bone, the neck bone connected to the backbone, the backbone connected to the hip bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. And didn't those slaves receive new inner life despite their dreadful surroundings? Well now, if we have received everything from the Lord, including forgiveness, and including near life, what are we going to do about it? Well, John the Baptist said, bear fruits befitting repentance. Act like forgiven people. 
Pastor Norman Brown used to go with us to the prisons, and this is what Pastor Brown would say to the inmates. You receive forgiveness, so this means think of yourself as being on a basketball court, and you're dribbling, I'm not gonna call them our house eights, women, had that glorious victory yesterday. Think of yourself as dribbling, dribbling a ball on a basketball court, and you're going down toward this end of the court. Turn around. You've got to go exactly in the opposite direction. You've been forgiven. You need a new life. Turn around and go in a new direction, going back to the other end of the court. That's what we must do. You must turn around, find a new direction. No more selfishness. No more meanness. Can it be done? Well, right now, our entire country is very, very worried about violence. And I'm giving illustrations here from the Lord's miracles in prison. But I would suggest there's more, to, more than one way to handle violence than locking up people behind bars, giving them longer than needed sentences, and essentially throwing away the keys. Like, for example, why don't we abolish poverty? Poverty generates crime. When kids have lost all hope because their school is hopeless, and when they don't see job opportunities, out of frustration, as we all know, kids do crazy things. What if we improve those schools so that the education in the poorest neighborhoods, what if the education in the poorest neighborhoods was just as good as the education in the wealthiest neighborhoods? Wouldn't that improve health? Wouldn't that lead to safer neighborhoods? What if we improve the houses in poor neighborhoods? Just a few ideas. God brings new life. He's going to give us new life because we're filled with hope. It's a difficult time now, but we see God on the horizon and we know that God is there waiting for us. And he's going to bring us out of this but he counts on us to do our part. And what does it mean? It means getting together with other people, like here at this church, looking at the problems, discussing them, and finding a way out. We're going to do it, because we have new life in the Lord, and loved by him, forgiven by him, we can say, praise the name of the Lord. Amen.